So prayer is a very important element in the Christian life. One of them that I'd recommend to keep in mind is concerning spiritual warfare when you pray. When you pray, it's not a regular routine. That is important to understand. And it is an intimate relationship with God. But here's something you don't understand as well. When you have that intimate relationship with God, there will also be somebody out there who wants to ruin that relationship. And I think what we don't understand is that we don't understand that prayer is battle. Prayer is not just something where you communicate with God. What will also accompany prayer will be spiritual warfare. And that is an absolute fact. The one thing that Satan wants to destroy in your life, now keep in mind, this is something you want to listen to. What you want to listen to is that in Ephesians chapter 6, you're going to see from verses 14 all the way through verse 17, all the list of the armor of God. And what you're going to notice is that verse 16, it says above all, as if this is like one of the most important armor. Verse 17, we would probably think that the word of God is the salient thing for an attacking. Now here's something to understand. Each of them are the most important armaments in their own place. For the shield of faith, it's so that you can fend off the fiery darts of the wicked, which is true. If you have no faith, then what's going to happen is Satan, he's going to discourage you. If you have faith, out of all the armament, you're going to keep going, actually. So faith is a very important element. Sword of the Spirit is obviously important because that's your only attack weapon. But if there is one thing you need that is most important than all your armor is verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Now why is verse 18 the most important? I thought that verse 16, 17 would probably be the most important armaments. You'll notice that verse 18 is not part of the armory. What you're going to notice is that verses 14 through 17 is your armor. It lists all these actions that matches with the armor, but it does not do that with verse 18. You know why? Because verse 18 is not part of the armor. It is part of spiritual warfare. That's something important. Armor is protection and attacking, but prayer is your secret weapon. That's something to understand. That's a secret weapon. If there is one thing that Satan, now keep this in mind, I don't care how much of the Bible you know with that sword, I don't care how much faith you have as a pastor keeping the church going, I don't care how great your other armors are, there is one thing that Satan would want to attack the most, and that's your prayer life. Not your Bible reading, not your Bible knowledge, uh, not your soul winning, not your church attendance, not the other parts of the armament, it's your prayer. Do you know why? Because that's your secret weapon. Why? Because prayer requires no armor. Prayer is nothing but the power of God. That's something you got to understand. Prayer is nothing but the power of God right there. So that's why Satan, if there's one thing he wants to attack, is your prayer life. If you have all the armor, but you're without prayer, trust me, that armor is going to rust away pretty soon. Isn't your Bible reading rusting away? Isn't your helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, staying away from sin, rusting away? But if you keep doing prayer, you're asking for God's help to keep re releasing you strength, renewing your strength. Like uh, one of our brothers mentioned about spiritual life going up and down, so I would like to request prayer to keep it up. Why? Because that's the, that's the secret weapon. Now, this is one thing that's sad. It's sad that we would request prayer about something like that as a last, when we hit a last resort method. Isn't that something to think about? As a last resort, we want to pray to keep going for the Lord, to not lose faith, to not be discouraged. Shouldn't that be a daily thing in your life? That way you never have to even face discouragement to begin with? Backsliding? Hardship? So prayer, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. Now here's another thing about prayer. Another thing about prayer is that it says praying always with what? All. Did it say just prayer or all prayer? All prayer. 
This is not just a little Nehemiah prayer before you eat your meal. All prayer is, why, why do you think we have a prayer list? You ever ask yourself that? We have a prayer list because these are certain weaknesses we want God to intervene and help us with. So we want to cover all these weaknesses that we want to lift up in prayer. So this is not something that you just hear, pray for me, and then we pray and that's it. Why do you think the Bible says all prayer? That way you can keep covering that weak spot and lift that up to the Lord. So my question to you is, how many times have you been through that prayer list that we sent out through the church? So you got to look through those prayer lists, surrender that to the Lord, because why? Because just because you prayed for one area, it doesn't mean that Satan does not see another weak area that he can attack. Okay, so you got problems in your workplace? Fine, God answered your prayer on that, but what about your family life, huh? Then Satan's going to attack on that one. So you got to pray with all prayer. Sometimes you pray, Lord, bless us with a good church service. That's not good enough. You want to do all prayer. Why? Has there be, been some things in the church where it was not a good church service? What were those weaknesses? And did you ever lift those up to the Lord? That's good. That's real good. See, so you got to do it with all prayer. Because Satan is trying to find a weak spot in your prayer. And trying to find a weak spot in your prayer, he's going to attack that. Here's another thing concerning prayer. I want you to look at Romans. Keep your hand here. Keep your hand here, Ephesians 6. We might come back here. I want you to go to Romans 15. Romans chapter 15. E.M. Bounds mentioned this. He mentioned that if your prayer life is not as intense as your fighting life for the Lord, then your prayer life is not intense. So another thing concerning prayer is that it has to be intensive. So look at Romans chapter 15. Notice what Paul mentioned concerning about prayer. He mentioned that it should be, uh, that ye should strive in your prayers together for me. That's what he mentioned right here. You'll notice verse 20. What does it say? Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel. And if you know Paul's life, he was uh, very, he, he went through affliction, man. He st strived a lot for the Lord, but despite of that, he knows that he's weak because of verse 30. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit, that he, what? Strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. Your prayer life, is it intense? If it's not intense then you're not fighting. Remember, prayer is part of the spiritual warfare, right? If you're good at fighting the devil in the shield of faith, and you're good at fighting the devil with your sword of the spirit, breastplate of righteousness, helmet of salvation, gospel of peace, winning so many souls, if your soul, so basically your soul winning is intense, your Bible study is intense, and living right is intense, but your prayer life is not intense, you're not... Uh, your fighting life is not going to be intense. Satan, he's going to rust out your armor eventually. And if you think you can have all the armor without prayer, then you're in trouble. Prayer life should be as intense as you're fighting. So are you fighting for the Lord? And aren't you, some of you are going through trials and you're really fighting hard, right? If you're fighting that hard, I wonder if your prayer life is just as hard. See? See? Prayer must be as intense as you're fighting. Why? Because prayer is fighting. Fighting is not, okay, uh, stop yourself from crying, think happy thoughts, and keep soldiering on. I'm going to just go out for Jesus. And that's not fighting, man. That's using the works of the flesh to keep fighting rather than the Holy Spirit. And if you go by the means of the flesh, trust me, your flesh will break down and wear out, and you will resort to fleshy methods to solve your problem. That's why people seek medication. That's why people seek therapy. That's why people seek worldly friends. People seek alcohol. They seek fleshy things to give them victory. 
rather than the power of God because they keep going by fleshy methods. Here's another thing right here. I want you to look at James chapter 4, please. James chapter 4. E.M. Bounds claimed one of the most dangerous things in prayer is called selfish prayer. That's one of the most dangerous things. If you're in a battle, this, what, this is what you got to think. When you're in a battle, you're not only thinking about yourself, you're thinking about the well-being of the whole army. Amen. Now think about this. If the Lord blessed our church compared to other Bible-believing churches differently, I want to say this as something that Bible believers should think upon. I'm not saying I'm the greatest church. I'm definitely not a prayer warrior. But I want to say this, is that if there is something that may be different about this church compared to other churches, it may be because the prayer life in here was thinking about the whole picture of the well-being of the army. You know what pastors nowadays do? They just pray about the problems going on in their own church, their own life, and they're content in their own area. But they're not thinking about the whole warfare out there. What about those heretics deceiving souls, damning them to hell? What about people around the world who are without God, without the gospel? That's why your offerings weak supporting missions and more of it goes towards your building. Amen. See, that's, you got to think about the welfare of the whole army, not just, you know, my grandmother died, so please pray for relief. Trust me, you need that prayer. We should pray about that. But if all of this is about you, that's right. where I need prayer and not the well-being of the whole army, there's a problem here. Look at James chapter 4, verse 3. Ye ask and receive not. Why does God not answer your prayers? Because ye ask amiss that ye may what? Consume it upon your lust. Remember this. Selfish prayers is unanswered prayer. So look at your prayer life. Sometimes you have to inspect yourself why you requested that prayer to the Lord. Okay, why is it that you need comfort in your life? Is it because you're thinking about the well-being of the army or the well-being of yourself? Trust me, if you're thinking about the well-being of the army, it will include your well-being too. Okay, so you need comfort. Great, that's your welfare. But are you thinking about the welfare of the army? The welfare of the army will include your own welfare. Lord, it's because if, I'm, if I don't receive that comfort, I won't be able to have the strength to be able to help out other people who are going through affliction in the church. I'm going to have an excuse to skip church service and to uh, lose my service for you, so I desperately need your comfort. That, see, you're thinking about your welfare where you need it, but at the, your welfare should coincide with the welfare of the whole army, the well-being of the whole army. You've got to think about that way. You know, I gave a promise to the Lord a long time ago. If you give me this degree and if you give me the powerful means to reach every single person around the world, Lord, then I will not compromise and crush every scholar out there who belittle Bible-believing truth. That's why, I don't, that's why I kept my word to God. See, that's why the Lord blessed us with an online ministry. That's why the Lord put us in an international area. You know why? I gave a prayer that was thinking about the well-being of the whole army right here. That's why I'm not going to hold back my sarcasm, my hard preaching when I, when I point out these false prophets. You know why? I made a promise to God a long time ago. But other pastors, they're just thinking about their own church, their own group, afraid that it might offend somebody. Okay, that might change your prayer life, right? It will change your prayer life. Okay, let's uh, look at the book of Jude, the book of Jude. Jude chapter 1. One thing I want to war, uh, war, I want to warn, <laughs> one thing I want to warn concerning about prayer and spiritual warfare is concerning about the charismatics. Charismatics, this is really bad right here. So charismatics, they tend to be very spiritual, which is a good thing. But they confuse spirituality where it contradicts scripture. That's important to understand. So when you're doing your prayer life, there's the thing with these charismatics. A lot of them really get deep into prayer and Holy Spirit filling, which is a shame for Bible-believing Christians. We should get into the spirit world too a lot. But the problem with the charismatics is that they do it without the boundaries of scripture. 
Now, you Bible believers know so much Bible in your head, you already got the boundaries. It's about time you better start delving into the spiritual matters. Now, here's a warning that I want to uh, get, get at, that you got to watch out for these charismatics. These charismatics, what they get into is that they get so deep into the spirit right here, they think that anybody in the church is practically demon-possessed with something. So then what they will do is that they will pray to cast out some devil, and they will look at anything out there, and they would try to say, I bind you, Satan, in the name of Jesus, etc. Let me tell you something. That is not right spiritual warfare. You know how you win a battle? You win a battle by playing smart against your enemies, not being dumb. So you got to look at Jude, for example. Here's one example right here. Look at Jude. These charismatics don't know their Bible. Look at verse 8. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion. And look at this part, speak evil of dignities. Now, look at the, what follows context. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, what, when he fought with the devil? He didn't say, okay, Lord, I'm going to pray that you put hell upon the enemies and then you, I bind him, Satan in the name of Jesus and then you try to do all these kind of prayers attacking the gates of hell. No, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said the Lord rebuke thee. You know what the best advice is? The best advice is, Lord, I cannot handle the devil right here, so I turn him to you. You just take care of everything right here. So you've got to do that. You know what the problem with charismatics are? A lot of them in their sermons and in their books, you got to pay attention to these guys. If you hear a really good preacher and speaker online or in a book that talks about spiritual warfare, I'd look at their background first before I read it. You might say, why? Because I guarantee you this, it's going to be something charismatic you're going to find out. And charismatics, they have a tendency to bring in the devil with them, not attacking the devil. You might say, why? Because the reason why is, is that the charismatic experience, if that's not of God, speaking of tongues, you know, the healings and all that, then what is that of? That's of the devil right there. So you got to realize that when they get so much into the spirit, yeah, I'll tell you what kind of spirit that is, an evil spirit. So you Bible believers should not be influenced by charismatic preachings and writings because what? You're going to carry a devil with you. So if I were you, I'd stay away from those guys. So concerning charismatic, they dramatize everything like, you know, Satan's in here and Satan's in there, Satan's in there. Well, you got to realize that sometimes it could be Satan using your own flesh. A lot of times we like to put blame on other people. We like to blame on the situation. But we don't look at ourselves. Maybe it's because you schedule something wrong. You ever thought about that? Maybe it's your own dumb fault. You ever thought about that? And Satan used you on that one. I'll tell you one thing Satan wants to attack more is that he wants to attack your flesh more. So that's how Satan gets you the most is through the flesh right here. So if you want to see spiritual warfare, it's not to see the devil in that person has a devil, that person has a devil, this situation has a devil, that thing calls a devil. Don't get me wrong, there are devils out there that use as people, but if I were you, I'd first look at the devil in me before I put the blame on the devil in something else and other people because Satan can definitely use that. You know why? Because Satan is king over all the children of pride. And that attitude is a pride mentality right here where everything's of the devil except you. That's your weak spot Satan goes for, where you don't think you're that weak spot for Satan to attack, but everything else out there. So you know what I do before I jump the gun and think the devil's in this situation or the devil's in this person out there or in this person in our church? You know what I do? I say, okay, I got to look at the devil, how he's using me to think first. And when I do that, I prevent myself from shooting out my mouth saying something that the devil can use to hurt the church and hurt my life and make me look like a moron to, to many people out in public. You better be careful of that. Satan can use you. So when you go against the gates of hell, the best advice is you don't. What you do is you turn that over to the Lord. Say, God, I can't handle it. Look, do you know what would happen if Satan unleashed the gates of hell right now in our church? We won't have a ministry. 
you know what's preventing him from doing it? Because we're not going against him. We're saying, Lord, put a boundary, please. You handle it. Satan, the reason why he can't go all out against us is because he's waiting for God's permission. And the reason why he has to wait for God's permission is because we pray to the Lord. Protect our church, please. Don't close our ministry, please. We need to reach more souls out there. I'm not going to pray against the devil like saying, Lord, I pray against... No, I, I, no I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go, shh, shh, shh. Yeah. I'm going to say, Lord, just, I just want you to take care of it, please. I just want you to just protect us from his attack. See, Look, if you dare the devil, trust me, Satan's going to really pay attention to you and really try to ruin your work in ministry. Trust me, you don't want the devil to pay attention to you. You want your eyes set on Jesus Christ, not on yeah. Satan anyways. Amen. Amen. All right. So another thing is 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. You can write that down. I've got to wrap this up. So 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. The Bible says, so we looked at 1 Peter 5, 8, and then the book of Jude. So these passages show what, how to deal with satanic forces. You know how you deal with satanic forces? Leave it to God. All right? You notice that Michael durst not bring a railing accusation against him, right? Durst not means he doesn't dare. Michael, you know how much stronger he is than you? And guess what? Archangels, you know, they're supposed to be in a sinless state, right? What makes you think you're more capable than Michael the Archangel? <laughs> That's why if, I, if Michael had better sense, I would, uh, I would triple my security more than Michael the Archangel. Okay, Lord, you, you, you take care of it, please. Lord, please take care of it. So that's how you handle satanic forces. You don't like pray all the power and go against them. No, 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 you, you pray and let God handle them. All right, so let's look at the book. So we wrote down 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. That is part of spiritual warfare, is Satan is more interested in attacking you, not at situations around you, not at people around you, not the false prophets, not the false churches. Because they already got the devil. He wants you. So you got to look. If you're going to be aware of spiritual warfare, you have to look at self first beyond anything else. And that will prevent you from shooting out your mouth, from doing something and causing something wrong. A lot of people rush ahead of the will of God because they feel like they're confident about their spiritual walk. And that's where Satan gets you. The Bible warns you about take heed lest ye fall when you think that you're so spiritual. Paul warned that at the book of Galatians. If any man think he be spiritual, take heed lest he fall. That's something right there. So 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, he's looking for something. So that's why you have to be always, what coincides with prayer is watching. And that's found at Ephesians 6 and Matthew chapter 24. So we can look at Ephesians 6, for example, real quick here. So notice it mentioned verse 18 again, watching thereunto with all perseverance. You want to accompany his prayer is watching. You know one thing I notice within Bible, I'm talking about not just Bible-believing members, but Bible-believing pastors too. You know one thing that's sorely disappointing about these people is that I notice that they are not watchful people. They lack so much discernment. And they jump the gun in accusations and judgments so many times. That's one thing. You know why? Because they think they're confident that they know enough of the Bible so they can say it. Now, did I get, under, did I get anybody under conviction hearing that? Now, you got to watch. So I want to warn not just Bible-believing members, but pastors too. Sometimes they jump the gun, shoot off something that they shouldn't have said, taught something, said something on the pulpit, pastor something that they should not have done. You know why they lack so much discernment? I wonder about their prayer life. But not only about their prayer life, if they're so prayerful, they'll also be very watchful. Cautious people are the ones who tend to be prayerful the most. If you claim you prayed a lot, 
my, I would say this, I don't think you prayed enough. I think that you weren't watchful. If you prayed a lot, then here's something that I want to say. You probably didn't pray right. It doesn't matter how many times you prayed and fasted. Were you praying right? Remember right here, James chapter 4, self. Was there something concerning self? I know I'm right about this, Lord. So because of that, I pray that you will uh, attack that member and that pastor. And I've had that happen at PBI. I'm not talking about our church. I'm talking about PBI where I graduated from. Bible believers have that tendency. They think they're right about something. And then so they, when they're praying to the Lord, they wasted one whole hour praying about self-justification and then ruining the enemy. So you know what I do? This is what I do. I believe that you can be right about something and that you should pray that the Lord will handle your enemies. I do that. I said that publicly online too. But you know what I do before I say that? I wonder if you do this in your prayer while you're angry and frustrated. And trust me, this pastor went through it. I say, Lord, if there's something I'm doing wrong, then please show me before I pray something wrong right here. And you know what the Lord does? The Lord, he always does this, I know this. You know what he does? So I am in the right, and the Lord will handle my enemies. And you've seen that happen before, right, when we prayed? It didn't take that long either how the Lord handled our enemies, right? And those enemies know. They got embarrassed enough. One got so hyped up mad, and then he said, well, guess what, Gene? Nothing bad happened to me. And then the same day that he shot off his mouth after that, his hero pastor got inflicted and hospitalized, and the doctors don't know what the problem is. So see, but you know what I do? When I pray concerning them, you know what happens? I always see what's wrong with me first. And when I see that, uh, I know that I'm right about a matter, but trust me, you're not completely right. And then I'll see some things, and then I'll confess it to the Lord. And guess what? The Lord handles my enemies, and I'm in the right at the end. You know what God does? He wants to see this one gotten rid of first, because yeah. Satan's trying to hit right here. So I hope that this will open your eyes about spiritual warfare, is you're always watchful. First Timothy chapter 5. And by the way, I want to say this too. Even though this was aimed particularly toward the women, I want you men not to lose a blessing out of this too. I see a lot of men applied in this one too. So women will not only take uh, the, blessing, the blessing of application here, the men can also take the blessing of application here too. So don't feel bad that this is just for women and that you men miss out. No, this will include you too. So notice right here concerning about women, what God talked about. He mentions that 1 Timothy chapter 5, and then we'll read verse 5. Now she that is a widow, indeed, and desolate, trusteth in God, and continueth in supplications and prayers, what? Okay, so this woman who pr prays very frequently is not going to fall into this one. And this one is even de devil possession. Look at this one. What you're going to see is at verse 13, and with all, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, and busy bodies, speaking things which they ought not. Verse 15, for some already turned aside after what? Satan. Satan. There are two things that I question about your prayer life. If you're, if you're idle, you got a lot of time on your hands. I would like to ask you what your schedule is like. And if in your schedule, you don't have that much thing, many things to do. But a second thing is, if you talk a lot, especially gossiping and tattling, the thing is, is that I wonder if you've been doing verse 5, praying. If you pray a lot, see, it's going to prevent you from these two things, which Satan can use at verse 15. You might say, how can Satan use that, Pastor? Sodom and Gomorrah, you know how they became the city they were? Idleness, abundance of idleness. How can they even think something perverted about homosexuality and even bestiality at Jude? You know why? They had too much time in their hands. And too much time in your hands makes you think a lot of things in your head. And when you think a lot of things in your head, that's where Satan gets you. So that's the reason why you got to watch out for that. Another thing is about your mouth, how Satan can use it is, 
one of the most demonic things I have seen, things that hurt the most is the tongue. What you say will cause an, pretty much an everlasting effect that the person will not forget even if they forgive you. They're going to remember what you said and they're going to think about you that way. And even if you reconcile and beseech forgiveness, they'll forgive you, but they're not going to forget. That tongue, that's the reason why, you know, you got to watch out for your tongue. Don't talk a lot. If you talk a lot, then that's going to be a problem where when you talk a lot, something wrong might even accidentally come out that you didn't even think about. You know what, you should be, if you're so good at this, you should be using this for praying. Yeah, if you're so good with so much time in your hands, idle, you can use that time for praying. You got plenty of time. Amen. So that's something you got to watch out for. And Satan can definitely use that, is idleness and the tongue. But, what can prev but if you have a life full of prayer, that's going, it's going to prevent these two things. Because when you pray to the Lord more and more and more, the Holy Spirit fills within you more and more and more and then shows you, hey, that's not right. What you're doing is wrong because you're so much filled with the Spirit. Idleness and talking is a fleshy tendency.